Okay, um, so I'm delighted to introduce our second invited speaker for this session. And uh, Liam Salmon, who's from uh, OCR, is going to talk to us uh, about part of his role. So we're delighted to welcome you, Liam. Thank you Lovely. very much. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you probably gathered, out is a very interactive conference. So hands up those people that are working in the FE and school sector. Just a lowly one, a two, a three. So, as you can see, we are a bit of a minority, but you know, it's important that we do stick together, and I think it's important that we share and learn from each other. And my presentation is going to talk about our experiences of e learning within the school and FE space. So, these are the infamous words from Donald Rumsfeld uh, the no knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And it's a phrase that often comes into my mind in working with school and FE, in that it's a constant challenge. It's a constant process of discovery and learning, and the truths that you hold are being challenged. And we heard from John earlier when he talked about vulnerability, so I'm going to expose a little bit of the vulnerability that we have. Now, we do know a few things. Um, for those who don't know who OCR, we are part of Cambridge Assessment, which is part of the University of Cambridge, so we do know quite a lot about assessment quite a lot about curriculum design, and an awful lot about working with schools. We work with a lot of schools, and in the UK, we work with a lot of colleges. We have an extensive vocational offer. And the two principal projects I'm going to talk about is, the first one is Cambridge GCC Computing. This was, to our knowledge, the first GCC MOOC, launched in September 2012, in partnership with Raspberry Pi and Cambridge University Press. Uh, it was based on the OCR GCC computing, so that's meaty, that's 120 guided learning hours, so there's a lot of design involved in that. It was primarily built for 14, 16-year-old learners and their teachers. It was very much our response to the shortage of computing specialist teachers and the transition from ICT to computing. We are very keen to engage teachers in the process. We've got nine master teachers from a variety of schools, mixture of schools, diverse group. We're really keen on that. They scripted and presented it. As, I, as you can see from the stats, it's very popular. We've had about, I think it's about 1.6 million times people have accessed the resources, and that's from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. So it is, it's on huge scale, as MOOCs should be. And then another project that we're working on at the moment, and particularly for the, the one FE college here, hello Gloucestershire, um, something that you're probably very familiar with. This is a blended e-learning service for those students that do not have a good grade, which is a C and above, in maths and English. So for those who are not in the FE sector, um, this is now a requirement. It's an requirement for young people um, that don't have a C grade, that they have to do that GCC or to do a stepping stone qualification. And it's a massive challenge to the FE sector. There's an estimated um, shortfall of about 1,100 maths teachers and 1,000 English teachers. Huge curriculum space. We're working across three qualifications. This is uh, Cambridge Progression Qualifications, your basic literacy numeracy, functional skills, and GCC foundation tiers. So that's the C. And the key thing is, and something I want to talk about, because going through this in my experiences, we're talking about engaging the disengaged. These are young people that probably had not the best experience at school, come to college, think, great, I'm doing hairdressing, great, I'm doing motor vehicles, and the first thing they're told is, you've got to do maths and English again. So this is a real challenge. Piloted in Kent, working with unemployed people, that was mainly because there was funding for the colleges and the independent training providers in that area, and extending the pilot nationally. So, and apologies for the simplicity of this, I'm very much structuring my short presentation around this simple model, which I often use myself when we, we, we're designing projects. So platforms. Platforms, obviously, very important. You need a platform. We work with many platforms. We're what I call platform agnostic. We don't have a propriety platform. We do do an awful lot of work in Moodle because it's very popular in the FE and school sector. And the thing I would say about platform, bear in mind the title of this conference is Learners as the Agent for Change. If you leave it in the hand of technologists, as I don't know if people agree with this experience, it will often be very much, here's the solution. You know, very much, wow, it can do this, it can do that. 
but the solution to what? What is the education experience we're aiming to? So the other side of the triangle you need is the content. So you need creative, engaging, sustainable content. Content in our world gets stale very quickly. So if you don't have an efficient model, you will run out of content very quickly. And young people are very demanding on content. And the third side of the triangle is curriculum. So bear in mind this is pre-18, this is the accountability system, this is national curriculum. You do need a structure. You do need some sort of curriculum authority to it. And the centre, I shall just put this on, this guy's called Jake. Jake is uh, 18, he's unemployed, he was sent by Job Centre Plus to work on our time project, and I'll just play this short clip on his experience of e-learning. When I found out I had to come on and do the course, I was a little bit, admittedly I was a little bit, you know, oh, not this again not learning maths and English again. But ever since I've been on the course, it's been, it's been, a, little bit of a, it's been a little bit of a ride, it's been okay. And uh, I've enjoyed it, I've enjoyed the maths and English, and I'm just working towards getting my C grades in both. Well, in school you're sat in a classroom with maybe 30 people, and the focus level was a bit different, really. In my opinion, when you sat down there on a computer and you, you've you literally got your headphones in, you're in your own little world, you're in your little bubble, and you focus on what's on the screen, and you don't have to look around, you don't have to focus on time, you don't have to focus on anything else, you just focus on the work, and it's much easier for me personally to crack on with math and English just on the screen. Now, I really like that video because, you know, we, big organisation, we produce our polished marketing videos where people are randomly pointing at things and smiling. Jake's not a tech evangelist. He wouldn't digest anything that's technical. He's a young lad. Oh, my God, I've got to do maths and English again. Really? All right. E-learning, I'll give it a go. It works for me, and he's got a purpose now. He wants to get that C, maths and English. He realised that improves his opportunities in life. I think it's really powerful. I could literally end the presentation there, that it's all about the learner. It's all about Jake. And if you lose sight of that, the content, the platform, the curriculum are pretty purposeless. But I don't think I'd be, be impressed if I just ended there, so I'll move on. So talking about platforms. So like I said, we work with a lot of platforms. Um, adaptive learning, God, I won't even list all the people we work with. And I often think about platforms, my experience of platforms, it's like TVs. You know, at first it's the awe of the technology. It's like, wow, I don't really know what I'm watching, but look at this box in the room and look at those pictures. And then, I know, depending on the platform, depending on your experience, how quickly you move to that, yeah, but why doesn't he do this? And I am that kid there. I was, you know, 80, in the 80s on a portable TV, trying to get the tube, trying to get that reception, you know, and it's like, ugh. And how it should be is there. Platforms should be in the background. You shouldn't see the platforms. Now, it's really interesting with the time work. With the time work, when we did all those video interviews of students, they talked about the learning experience, they talked about the peer support, they talked about the tutors, they talked about the content, they never mentioned the platform. And when we stood back and looked at this, we thought, God, should we be worried about this? And they realised, no, we shouldn't. The platform should be invisible. The learner and the tutor should be in control. So I just use this piece of research, not because um, it tells you probably anything different, that you know, it's all about the technology, we're talking about generation Y, actually we deal with generation, let me get my alphabet X, Y, Z, we deal with generation Z, we're dealing with people that haven't joined the workforce. Um, but what's really interesting, two things about this piece of research, is one, that quote about young people's relationship with technology may be more complicated than we might first think. Steve talked about it yesterday, I don't like the language of digital natives. I am the tech support for my wider family. My nieces and nephews phone me up when they want to get things working. I'm in my 40s. So, you know, this idea that everyone comes to it tech savvy, you, really, you've got to think about the jakes. You've got to be personalised. The other thing I love about this is, and this is CIPD, so they work, this is personnel development. They work with employers. They've uh, interviewed a whole load of apprentices, a whole load of graduates. And the thing they hated the most was e-learning. They did not like that. Why they didn't like it is because they come to it with the experience of Facebook, with Twitter. They come to it with the experience of Netflix, YouTube. If you give them what I call that dead finger, that clicking, clicking, clicking experience, they will turn off very quickly. 
So, learning analytics. I don't know if people, probably the HE colleagues, you'd be aware of the work of Solar, a lot of good stuff they do on learning analytics. And we are broadly in this space. And according to the research of Solar, about 70% of people are in that space. Now, I don't know, it would be good to hear to Gloucestershire if they're different, but FE in school, in my experience, are probably 90% in that space. It's still very much learning. So we do your granular data, how you can really engage. We do your visualization of data, but we need to move into this space. It's about how we support the sector, particularly the FE in the school sector, how we support them to make sense of this data, because data in itself has no value. Only if you can turn it to intelligence, only if intelligence can become teaching interventions and strategies, does it have any value. What we have learned about data is tutors, lecturers, and teachers are time pressured. Don't drown them in data. And this is one of the challenges we find working in adaptive learning. It is a water full of data. What they want is the few buckets. They want to know the few buckets and what they do with those few buckets. Don't give them a fighter pilot dashboard. Give them a Morris Minor. Give them the four, four dials that help them know what to do and tell them what to do it with. So moving on to content. So I've got a team of three uh, developers, designers, just working on time alone. We produce an awful lot of content. This is, we're very much on publisher's scale. So this is not so much the HE experience of lecture capture. So we do the whole suite. We do pitch and pitch, talking heads, tutorials, on screen, yada, yada, yada. We do the whole lot. So we're really interested in what works. And it's quite interesting the research that's coming out on what works. So this is, and apologies if I mispronounced his name, Gure Tao. Um, they did research on four courses on edX, 6.9, I think, or 6.1 million learning episodes. A really interesting piece of research. And you've got these. I won't read them out to you, but you've got these sort of key, you know, these key things. People plan, keep it short, personalize it, keep it flowing, talk fast, that engagement, something I pick on later. Different formats, different purposes. High production value isn't enough. That, that's something that we're learning. You can spend a fortune on content, and that's something I draw on. So I thought I'd do a little bit of research on our own videos. This is for the MOOC. This is for a year, the 200 top videos. As you can see, we've had 337,000 views. So that's a lot of views, a lot of rich data there. And look at that distribution. Well, first of all, you can see the A, B, Cs, and Ds. So we were already from GUE realizing that you've got to break this down. We're dealing with young people here. You can't give 30 minutes of lecture capture. You've got to break it down and atomize it. But look at the distribution. So it's really interesting. So I thought, right, well, let's have a look at the top four. Why are they the top four? Now, number one, this guy's called Clive. He's from Raspberry Pi. I don't know if people know about Raspberry Pi. Really exciting. He's from Raspberry Pi. X just left teaching when he joined Raspberry Pi. Engaging, really engaging guy. He's got 24,000 views. But the other thing about that video is it's the first one. This is a MOOC. MOOCs, as you know, have that terrible drop-off. So is it that people are just going there, watching the first one, and they're not progressing? The second and the third one, um, animations, Clive again, the guy in the bottom land corner third is Jason. So we had animation within there. They're technically complicated. You know, I'm no computing expert, but algorithms in pseudocode is quite hard. So is it that, you know, the students are going to them because that works for them? So again, we look, we, I looked at engagement. I looked at, well, okay then, what are people watching the longest for? So this is, this just plots a duration watched against duration of video. Now that bottom one there, that sample assessment material, right? We, this is quite a dull topic. I mean, just to bore you, GCCs, you have a thing called controlled assessment. It's a project. It actually forms part of your grade. So it's very important for the student need to understand it. We, it was an eight-minute video because it is, you can't necessarily break it down. They've got to understand the synoptic. They have to understand everything that's required. So we outsourced an animation. I thought it was beautiful. It was a sock machine. And we had these people in fire, and no one watched it. Well, no, they watched it. They only watched half of it. So why spend all that money on the content? Could we have done something differently? So what does that tell us? You know, and this is now, I think, moving into the known unknowns, although hopefully some of you may have these answers. Is it about video format? Is it about content and subject matter? Is it about course structure? Is it about presenter? It's probably all four. 
And this is one of the areas we want to know more and more and like to understand more. So one thing we have learned, though, is about the content dealing with young people. Give them choice. Personalization of content. We talk about personalization of uh, data, but personalization of content is really important. So just very briefly, this is what we're doing with time. This is the work in maths and English. So, you know, we do an initial assessment. We then determine which level they are, and that little picture of levels there is a spiky profile. That's sort of like, say someone's level two in their comprehension, but they're not so good in their spelling and punctuation. So this allows people to move around. But what's interesting, how they move around in pathways is they move around with different content pathways. So these five things are stories. We've actually got actors in, scripted stories, so it's contextualized learners. You're dealing with young people that have gone to college, probably had a bad experience of maths and English, particularly maths. So we're trying to engage them in different ways. And we're giving them different pathways. So it may be, I don't, you know, I don't get learning context dealing with fundraiser. But what I'll do is I'll do it in the moving on. So this is us giving choice. Pathways and choice are really important. Control and choice. So talking about curriculum, the final part. So I'm drawing in here the language of curriculum design. So you get this notion of, you've got, actually, I think it's six facets of curriculum, but I won't get into curriculum. It's not curriculum uh, lecture. Um, intended. Intended is very much that policy, that framework, that structures. What is intended? Now, government clearly have a keen interest in the intended. And remember, I'm talking about the school and the FE sector. They have your Ofsted. They have your national curriculum. They have your accountability measures. So these are really important, and government is very important, and they don't have the freedoms of HE. Now, how that translates into the language of e-learning, well, you know, this is more instructional design process. I probably couldn't tell you enormous amount like that that you don't know already, you know, the work done at it. This is probably the area that's really interesting for me personally and for us as an organization, the enacted curriculum. What actually happens in the learning experience? Because that's the space in which people learn. And I won't read that out to you. But what's really exciting about dealing, I mean, Steve mentioned yesterday, disruptive pedagogies. You know, you're dealing with an enacted curriculum of which you don't have enormous control. It's not the intended curriculum, the didactic, the chalk and talk. This is disruptive. It has collaborative learning. It has contextualized learning. It has learner agencies, learners with control. And it spins around. And this is, oops, this is quite challenging for a sector, you know, that is, is under pressure, has got to meet a whole load of targets. Now, we, I mean, one of the biggest things we feel we can support as an example is in that support, letting people be brave. Let people take risks. I mean, one member of my team is lovely. When we saw the learners and the uh, tutors engaging on the pilot with time, they said, blimey, it's like we've taken them to the playground and they're going down the slide head first. We can't control these experiences and it's something we should celebrate. So just ending with that um, Donald Rumsfeld again. So this is his biography, and it's more humble tone than this known, unknowns. And it's very much that humility of knowledge and that sharing, which I think out has an enormous role to play, how we learn and share from each other. Um, and what I find very interesting is apparently attributed that known, unknown to a, someone in NASA. There's something nice about that NASA, that exploring, that discovery, that going Star Trek-y beyond borders. So that's me, and I think my final word is, let's just go down the slide head first together. And I'd love to hear more about what you guys are doing and any comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liam. Um, so we go straight into questions, comments. And Thanks, Tim. I was really interested in your talk, particularly what you talked about, what you can learn from your data, about all the different examples of learning materials. I think one of the things we found over the, um, the years, it's quite hard for um, providers to kind of engage with learning those lessons if, if we don't share sort of what works and what doesn't. In terms of your work at OCR and what you do, um, what is your way of kind of, you know, getting us to understand sort of what what works and what doesn't for learners? 
things like this. I think it's being more open. I mean, you know, we're really keen to get engaged about as in Omar and, you know, how we can do it. We work with virtually every college and school in the country. So it's doing these sort of things, doing blogs. I'm trying to get involved in the colleges in the east of England. I'm meeting someone on Friday. I think it's just getting out there. I mean, I do feel for colleges enormously. They're under enormous time pressure, as are schools. But if they don't reach out, I'm worried whether they'll be able to respond to the new gender, particularly the FE and the funding cuts that come in their way. They do need to look at new delivery models. Yeah, I think it's just sharing and being open. We'll be as open as we can. And bear in mind, there are commercial interests in here. We know our competitors will be looking at this. But from our point of view, we have got an education mission. We're part of the University of Cambridge. We'll be as open as we can and share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a question over there? Hello. Hi. Um, Una from Hi, BBC. Una. We met yesterday. Um, really, really interested in your, in your time platform. And I work in post-16 and adult, as well as secondary learning and in um, making online e-learning courses. So really, really interested. I was going to ask a sort of a, a fairly simple question, I guess, which is that I'm very interested that your time platform is aiming at a whole range of qualifications, so Cambridge Progression, Functional Skills and GCSE. And I guess if the simpler question about that would be, how do you go about synthesising all those qualifications into a, a framework for learning that you can take the learners through? But I guess the underlying question there is a sort of a more complex and political one about actually if these are learners who've been failed by the school system and by a traditional exam system, how do you get the balance in that sort of curriculum design for that course between good practice and teaching people to, to, to um, and, and supporting people to pass qualifications? Does that make sense as yeah. a question? I'll break into two, yeah. shall I? I think the first bit is about that. Yeah, you're right, it is really meaty. I can't remember how many hours of content it is. It's a huge amount of It's careful design. It's having those pathways, but giving, giving guidance in that choice. So it's that spiky profile thing. We've got to allow people. I think you know, there's nothing worse as a learning experience of, and we've all experienced it, of like, well, I'm, I, I, get, I get speaking and listening. I get it. Why do I have to go for another three bloody lessons on speaking and listening? You want to personalize the learning experience. Now, if the e-learning, if the support does not match that personalization, then where does the tutor and teacher go? So we do have a huge curriculum space, you're right. It allows people to move around. Going back to your um, qualification question, if I get it right, we as, a, as an awarding body, we're very passionate about, it's not all about assessment. It is the learning experience. Assessment is only one component of curriculum cohesion, I think the language is. Um, so that's why, again, what we really enjoy about e-learning is you can have that bound, you know, the borderless, boundless. You can allow that sort of, like, and that form, someone says, oh, I found this something really interesting. It's got maybe nothing to do with GCC English. Something on bite size or something like that. You know, and that's really good. It allows people, whereas before, and, I, and we work with the publishers, and they're great, but if you're working with a textbook or you're working just a specification, you're in narrow confines. The tell allows you to be borderless. It really is just great. It allows for that exploring beyond the specification. But let's not be naive, because you know, if you type into Google, if YouTube, put GCC Maths, you get 40,000 videos. You, that is not the same as a structured learning experience. You know, we, let's, we do need to give structure to it. People are purposeful. They do want a qualification. So it's about leading to a qualification, but allowing people to explore either side of that, those boundaries. Question right at the back. Yes. Martin, do we have any online questions? OK, should we take that one straight afterwards? Online personally. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking, what was, I can't remember, was it Ken, was it the name of the guy in the centre of the triangle? Uh, Jake. Jake. Oh, <laughs> there's a K in it, that's as close as I get. Um, what was fascinating with me is his, his maths he was doing, but he's also doing his English, and he was incredibly articulate. Um, but he also talked about that difference of concentration. Um, I recall a friend in school who was one of the brightest people I knew, but dropped out of school, became an alcoholic, in fact. But, um, but because in the class, he had to be the class fool. Yeah, and 
it's interesting, I mean, and it's something that's so critical to these situations is it's, the, it's not about the, 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 the knowledge pouring bit, but the social situations oh. of schools, which sometimes work to people's benefit because yeah. sometimes you concentrate better with others, other people don't. And, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, it's, not a, it's, yeah, it's not really no, a question, but it's really, really big, big it's issue. A, it's mm. a really good observation. So I only chose Jake and I only did a one minute slot out of, I think it's about a five minute interview. But there was about six other people, which you can go onto the Time website and get them. And they, what's fascinating, they all talk about bad experience at school. And what they know, they don't talk about bad experience. They talk about, I was lost in a classroom. I was literally part of a fodder factory. Yet with e-learning, and particularly this is blended learning, we're very passionate about blended learning, so it's still tutor-supported. This is not autodidactic. So, you know, they, they just get in that zone, and they support each other. And Will, my colleague earlier, he asked the question about the personal. Where we got a bit scared is they start really sharing personal stories, you know, but that's part of the experience. So I agree with you. It does give... I, I do passionately believe that it's, it's a disruptive pedagogy. It does change things. Um, and I'm not against the school experience in any way, but the school experience is a different one, and the post-16 does allow possibly a different experience. Um, we've had quite a lot of people following this online and, and making comments about some of the challenges that are being faced in FE. And I was just wondering, following on from what you said, um, you talk about it's all about the learner and their centre stage. But with all the pressure, with the funding cuts, with the policies being implemented, um, what is your personal take on, on what we can do to really put the learner centre stage rather than you know, just efficiencies on the bottom line? Two, two answers to that, I think. One, you know, I, I'm very blessed. I've got a really creative and bright team, but they come to me with techie talk, and it's a bit of that techie solution. And part of my job is to translate into management talk. I'm a director of OCR, and I, you know, I've got experience dealing many contacts with principals across FE colleges. You've got to talk their language, and I go back to that solution. You've got to say, this is the problem I am solving, not this is just the solution. Um, the other thing about the efficiencies, it's not just the cost driving. I am not of the agenda of the technology replacing the teacher, not in any way. It does lead to more efficient and impactful models. I think it's actually an expansive agenda. So one of the colleges that we're working with, East Kent College, um, they do a lot of work with employers. I think it's, it's one of the big, or oh, actually I better not, just in case it's commercially confidential. Um, they deal with one big employer that has a lot of shift workers with literacy and numeracy problems. Well, you can't get them into a classroom. So what they're doing is they're going to use time to train them at night. Blended learning helps you with that. That's an expansive agenda. That is colleges tapping into new markets, whereas traditional delivery models, you can't do that. If you're going to say be in this classroom at 9 to 5, at night, you know, 9 to 10 on a wet Wednesday morning, well, employers are going to go, not a chance, mate. So I think it's an expansive agenda. It's not just a reduction one. Right. Any That's final questions? Time. I think we're just about there. Liam, thank you very much. It's been really fascinating. I think Jake is going to be your sort of evangelist, your brand. It's all <laughs> your about Your marketing Jake. tool for, for this. It's been very good. Thank Lovely. you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you.